Alright guys, um, today what we're going to look at is a, a young lady that was in a car accident when she was 7 years of age um, and she lost her two front teeth uh, and today what we're going to do is take some wisdom teeth out and uh, place some implants um, and uh, do some bone grafting in this um, area. So let's take a look at the x-ray um, together and I'll just kind of walk you through what I see. Um, first of all, we have these three wisdom teeth that need to come out. Um, that's kind of a no-brainer. One thing we will do when we take these guys out is um, use a bone suction trap and save any autogenous bone, any of the patient's own bone, so that we can use it up in this area. Now this is the area where the two teeth were lost back when she was seven. She describes a previous grafting procedure where they used bone morphogenic protein. She said she had a lot of facial swelling, and you can kind of get a feel for the texture of the bone in this area, you know, compared to, say, uh, native bone, that this is grafted bone. You'll also notice that we've got this, this bone loss in this area. Also, if you look interproximally, you can see what the bone heights are here, 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 and then you'll notice that it drops um, much more um, apically here. It's probably like three to four millimeters uh, drop. If you go to this side, you're looking at bone, bone, and then bone, maybe two to three millimeters drop. So um, her smile line fortunately sits across this whole area so that when she smiles, it goes like this. Um, when we place the implants, we'll place the implants um, engineering the bone to be um, go straight across from here to here. So the top part of the implants are going to be sticking out of the bone a little bit on both sides. We'll add bone grafting material and I'll use a combination of a product called AUGMA, that's A-U-G-M-A, which is a hydroxyapatite cement um, that will ultimately be replaced into her own bone and the bone that we've saved in this area to graft this. Um, the other option for her that we discussed was going into braces where you grab onto the lateral incisors orthodontically and extrude them. And you would extrude them to get this bone um, up at the level here. But of course as you do that, this tooth gets longer and longer. So you have to reduce the incisal length. If you, ha depending on how far you go, if you hit nerve, you then have to do root canals and crowns. Um, if you don't hit nerve, you still have to do a crown on those teeth. Um, and then what that does is it brings the bone level up to the ideal position, then you still graft the valley, and that way when she smiles, or lifts her lip up, lip up not when she smiles, but when you lift the lip up, um, the teeth would look um, pretty much normal length. She has decided to not do the ortho and the root canals and the crowns, and instead just place the implants, kind of working with what she has and the limitations, um, since it won't be an aesthetic issue um, unless she's in a hurricane and her lip flips up. That's about it. Um, so you're going to see here, coming up, um, extraction of these wisdom teeth. We're going to make that pretty brief and focus more on the placement of these implants. Now, in order to preserve the interproximal bone between the two implants, I'm going to use an Astra implant. Uh, the implants will be 4.2 by 11, possibly 13 millimeters. We'll see when we get in there. Um, in length, um, and uh, they will be engineered so that the fixture head sits at this level and at this level. Um, and uh, this will help uh, maintain interproximal bone, which also then gives us soft tissue. Um, it's important to note that the soft tissue is going to follow wherever the bone is. Um, when I place the implants, I will also take a fixture level impression so that while uh, these are integrating, uh, which will take four to six months, um, we can make some temporary restorations. Those temporaries will be placed about four to six months from now, and those will be used to have the soft tissue heal so that it looks as normal as it can in this area. And it'll have the normal scalped appearance, but these teeth will be longer in the end. I said, if you get it, you're good. All right, let's get some more kind of aesthetic. And you got a couple more cartridges to add on. Hey, what I'm going to do on the way you're at is I'm going to um, create a little space for that to roll and follow the direction of that, so hopefully I don't have to go fish out the roots yet. So, I made a little buckle hockey stick incision, I raised the flap, now I'm going to make a little buckle trough right in here, and we'll need the bone suction trap while we do this, because we want to save her bone, and we call it autogenous bone when it's the patient's own bone, that's the fancy word for it. 
So now that little device will keep in of the piece's own bones as we do this. We'll leave, right, lots of irrigation, perfect. Now, even if you get a little bit of tooth structure, healthy tooth structure, which this is a healthy tooth, other than it's a wisdom tooth and there's not enough room, if you get a little bit of tooth in, mixed in with your bone grafting material, it is no big deal. And the reason for that is because um, they've actually done studies where they take teeth, wisdom teeth, and actually grind them up and graft with teeth and with just the tooth dust, basically. Look like teeth, tooth dust. Kind of crazy, right? Okay, I'm going to see if I can push this out towards the distal. Sorry, give the camera an elbow there. A little pressure. And then I'll get a lower view. Can you see how that tooth is moving out? Wiggling now, it's moving backwards. Now we're going to get a force up on that thing and wiggle it. To see if that's enough to get it out in one piece. While we're waiting, I'm going to give this ultra long lasting local called x in this area. Stuff doesn't diffuse, so we have to make sure that we infiltrate. We don't need it there. Place it up here as well. Down here for this other lower tooth. Same spot as what I did on the other side. Can't see it so well because the bite block is in the way, but. Woo! Little stretcher. And then, I'm going to put some on the pallet here too. This is another tender spot afterwards. Right there. I know I'm making a mess, huh? <laughs> There, there. Let's go back to this now. Lower you. And now, I'm going to put this in so you guys can see. I'm going to force it. Place that on the tooth. Give it a little wiggle. Kind of gently roll it around. Roll it around. That's good. So there's that little hook at the end. Not too bad. I'll take it. So that's that tooth gone. Now I'm going to make sure that there's no granulation tissue, that everything's clean, no follicles good. Um, make sure it's smooth with the bone file. The edge right there, not anymore. Let's give it irrigation. And then um, I can use some real plain down here. I don't need bike down here. I always like to palpate it, make sure it's smooth that way too. Good. Alright, so out of the three teeth and two implants, let's call that five things, we're done one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll stick with this thing. Can I get a fresh piece of gauze? Now I need another fingerless screen right in this area. Okay, okay it seems like So we're going to do the exact same thing on the other side with this too. So a little buckle hockey stick release right here. Okay, periosteal elevator. And a slap action right in this area. Get a hand piece next. Okay, 
que el Jesse me va a dar una hora. Un abrazo. Yeah. Get a stitch going on there, make sure that's all stitched up. So when I was finished on the other side, I loaded this suture up so that I'm ready to go on this side so I didn't have to reload this needle. Just a little thing to help with efficiency with all this. Yeah. Get my jumps out of there, it was ready. Good. I'm glad we don't have to fish for those little roots. Irrigation. Okay, moving on now to here. We can take this out now. I'm going to put a fresh piece of gauze in there. In fact, I'm going to put a fresh piece of gauze directly over the extraction site. And then a fresh pringle screen just in front. Alright. First thing we need to do, we can switch that out now because I guess we'll switch it out for now. But when I go to the actual pilot holes, we can save the bones in that too. So 15 legs. Is this a fresh one? Is this a fresh one? Thank you. And then I'll need a pick up with um, teeth ultimately too. So, incision. I need to see this area first of all. So, incision. We need a vertical release on either side. So that's what that's all about. And a vertical release over on this side as well. Okay. I'm also going to go around the lingual aspect of that tooth. And that tooth. Periosteum. On the way. A nice, pretty flat. This tissue is usually pretty scarred and pretty fibrous. It takes a little work. And it's sometimes a bit of a challenge just to elevate this tissue, just to, to grafting and closing in the future, just because of the amount of scar tissue. It's kind of going from known anatomy to the injured area and the scar tissue. So I know I'm subperiosteal, I know I'm in a good spot. I don't need to start to see it's a little tenacious right in here. With a little encouragement from a sharp metal object. The tissue is bad. Now I also want to be able to see on the palate. So I can do this. This is why I released this tissue next to the lateral palate. So back. Now we can get a real feel for the size of the defect in this area. Alright, now. What's that? Propofol? I'm gonna need some more propofol. Okay. So I'm hitting anterior nasal spine right now. I'm gonna be able to see the floor of the nose here as well. This is all anatomy I need to be aware of and see and work with. In the end, we're going to have this graphic and we need this soft tissue to be nice and loose and able to close without tension on the flap. So that's what this is all about. Okay. So, let's take a look right here. This is nasal mucosa right here. Nasal mucosa right there from either side. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is have a pick up with teeth, and if you can just hold this like this for a second. Okay. What I want to do is I'll get the freshest 15 blade that you have now. Like I know we use that other one. This one has only been used once before, so it's still very, very good, very sharp. What I want to do is I'm going to release this now. It's called screwing the periosteum. So that by the time we come back, any kind of oozing and bleeding that I'm causing now will be done and it'll close and be an easier surgical site. You can kind of see this tissue loosen up as I do this and stretch out farther and farther. So now, when the time comes, we'll be able to just put that over top and it will um, not have tension. Okay, now I need a pot of fill. Okay.
70% overall drop in opioid use. And with the proper understanding and use of Expiral, you too can see the success that Expiral will bring to your clinic. Dr. McClelland, DDS, has been using it in his clinic for a few years now, and he's seen great success in his patients and their pain management every day. In this six-video series, you get a professional master class that will give you the jump start you need to include Expiral in your daily routine. It includes a bonus PDF with a patient information handout, post-op medical instructions, and a quick look sheet for the materials and supplies for explaining Expiral. Go to teachable.com today and get educated on a non-opioid anesthetic that will help your patients have a better day.